Cinema Wellman. I am your host, David, and my co-host today is David S. Pumpkins because we are going to break down for you the top 10 and bottom five for the month of October. How many films did we screen in October here at Cinema Wellman? Well, 88, which brings us to a 2022 total of 746, which means the current all-time total is 7,863, which means for those of you paying attention, the race to 10,000 now stands at 2,137 movies to go. Stick with me, I'll get there. <laughs> um, so uh, we're gonna break down, of course, the, the, the good, the bad, the worse, and whatever the hell Mondo Khan was. And, and that's coming up at the, at the end of the bottom five. And, and that is just, I don't even know what to say about that. So let's start where we usually start with the bottom. Now, some things have sorted themselves out. Um, there were a few films that I've screened in October that would have made the bottom five, but I've already eviscerated them in some other means. So what I'm talking about here is Lawnmower Man and the Mangler, which were covered in the Stephen King at the Movies episode, and then Creep Van and Bus Party to Hell, and they were covered in the Which Was Worse episode, Creep Van or Bus Party to Hell. So the herd has been thinned, and there are still some grazers out there to be picked off. So here we go. At number five on the bottom five, I get it. I cheated. I cheated. There are six films tied for the five slot, and just hear me out. This is part of uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000. So the, I'm going to give you the names of the films. We've got Mac and Me, which was an E.T. ripoff. We've got Atlantic Rim, which is a specific Rim ripoff. We've got Lords of the Deep. God knows what that was. The Daytime Ended, Killer Fish, Hysterical, Lee Majors, and A Tour of the Fighting Eagle. And they were part of a recent block of programming on Mystery Science Theater 3000, and they called that the Gauntlet. And I ran the gauntlet, but I spread it out over three days because I didn't want to totally lose my mind. Now, I realize that I'm cheating, including six films in one spot. But as uh, Hannah reminds me constantly, uh, my daughter's, uh, she's my David Pumpkins on my shoulder. And she's like, you know what, Dad, you're making up all the rules for this anyway. Just do what you want. So so that that stands. And it's just an excuse to talk about Mystery Science Theater 3000. So if you're not familiar with it, it's been around since 1988, and it features an astronaut and his robot buddies who are forced to watch awful movies, and they are being monitored, and their responses are being registered and all this stuff. We get to watch the movies over their shoulders and eavesdrop on their conversations about the film. The concept is is actually brilliant. It's wonderful. Um, the, and these movies are so bad that they'd be seemingly impossible to watch on your own without Jonah, the astronaut, and his robot friends. You, you, you couldn't do it by yourself. The humor is both ultra snarky and really smart at the same time. There are references that they'll make about what they're seeing, and sometimes those references are so obscure, you swear you're the only person watching that gets that reference. That's how good this is, and that's the magic of Mystery Science Theater 3000. This is one of the rare times that I'm going to recommend that you watch something on the bottom five, but go to Netflix, search MST3K or Mystery Science Theater 3000, pick a movie, and just watch them pick it apart. It's fantastic. All right, at number four in the bottom five, we have from 1966, The Wild Wild Planet. <clears throat> and if you look at the poster, if you were to read me these six items that the poster features, I'd be losing my mind. Laser Girls? Yes, please. A Four-Armed Strangler? Yes. Menacing Mutants? Must have. Doll Men? Mm-hmm. Flesh Fusion Experiments? Why not? An Armada of Spaceships? I love a good spaceship armada. But you put all those things together, and this was horrific. This was an Italian film. Now, Italy has given us many, many, many great films over the years, but mm, sci-fi, in my opinion, is not one of their strong suits, and this is just bad. This is just awful. 
I'm glad that they they didn't make a sequel. What's that? Oh, they they did. They made a sequel. Okay. All right. Well, they did. They made a sequel to that. What was it called? Oh, it's right here. <laughs> Thank you. It's right here at number three, and it's the War of the Planets. So Franco Nero again, more cheesy special effects. Um, the bad guys in this are actually green lights. That's all you've got? The budget disappeared? Well, I don't know. Green lights? Can we just green lights? Why green? Green means go. Why not red? Why not something menacing? In any event. And there's also a fight scene that was straight out of the old Batman TV show. The only thing missing was the, the those title cards with the psychedelia and the, on, the onomatopoeia pow, pop, bam. That, it was that bad. The miniatures in this looked tiny. They're not supposed to, you know? They're supposed to look regular size. There's also very questionable dubbing in this. I realize that's got to be very difficult to do. But if we're hearing words, at least let's see someone's lips on screen moving. Yeah. Where are those laser girls when you need them? At number two of the bottom five, we have from 1972... We have Blackula, and right away you're going to go, okay, that's got to be a, a black exploitation Dracula movie. And if you said that to me, I would say you are correct, and you get to skip it and move on. Unfortunately, I knew what it was, and I had never seen it, which shocked me. I checked the archives. I, I had to double check, because I swear that I, how could I have missed this? Because I am a huge fan of the black exploitation genre, even though I'm not happy with the with the term that they use to describe it, but, and just because you love a genre doesn't mean that you love it unconditionally. This was just bad. It was a bad vampire movie. So it's it, black exploitation. Take that out of the mix. It's just a, it was a bad vampire movie. Bad makeup, bad special effects, and and, and how can you have a black exploitation Dracula movie and rate it PG? Why even bother? We want blood. Is what we want. That's what we want from you. Um, not even a performance by the Hughes Corporation in this film could save it. Remember the Hughes Corporation? Rock the boat, don't rock the boat over, tip the boat over. You know that. Woo hoo hoo. Yeah, I'm not going to sing anymore. Good thing this is in a talent show. Number one on the bottom five. I referred to it earlier. It's from 1962, and it's titled Mondo Khan. This was so disturbing that I, like 10 minutes in, I took out a pad and a piece of paper, I mean a pad and a pen and started writing stuff down. Because the stuff that I was seeing, I was just like, what is this and why is this, more importantly? So this is presented as a shockumentary, which was going to dare to show us these you know, tribal rituals and, and, and all of these things, all of these bizarre uh, things that, that, that people do all over the world and everything. And what it ended up being, to me, was an excuse just to edit together all these grotesque images. Um, and on the blog, I, I just listed them in bullet points, and that's what I'm going to do on the episode here for you. Uh, and then we'll just move on to the top 10 for October. So here's the bullet points. Here's all things wrong with... Mondo Khan. These are what we see. And it's all real and none of it's staged. And that, I guess, is the what makes it what it is. Whatever the hell that is. So here's what we see. Uh, a vicious mass killing of wild pigs with, with machetes. Uh, puppies in cages at a dog restaurant where people are dining on dog right next to the cages. We have the beheading of a bull. We have a man killed by a bull. The guy deserved it, in my opinion. Live snakes being skinned. Um, a woman breastfeeding a baby piglet. And I'm questioning that because I did see it. And and I, I wrote it down. And I still question that I saw it. Uh, I also got to see geese being force-fed with a funnel. And women in cages, you heard that right so far. You could stop right there. Women in cages being fed tapioca to fatten them up. The most bizarre thing about this mess is that it got an Oscar nomination for Best Original Song. And 
I knew the song. I had never known that the song was from this film. It's the only reason I watched the film, because it was on a list. Um, if you go on the blog, I put a link, and the link is to the song More, which is the theme from Mondo Khan. And or you can just go on YouTube and or Spotify and the theme from Mondo Khan, listen to it, and go through that imagery in what I just described. It doesn't match up at all. At all. It's so bizarre. It like I said, it's it's kind of the most bizarre thing about this really strange movie. Blah. Blah. All right. Now, let's put that behind us and move on to the good stuff from October. And I do not mean candy corn. That is Satan's confection. Speaking of Satan, at number 10, we have from 2019, a film called Hilarious. Not hilarious, hilarious. And hilarious is basically, uh, they got eight different horror comedy shorts and just strung them together so we could watch. So it's like a mini film festival. The, the short films are titled Horrific, Killer Cart, Lunch Ladies, Death Metal, Bitten, Till Death, Born Again, and a very important film. Now, not all of them work, and I didn't expect them all to work, but all segments are worth watching. Some of them are fantastic. The ones that work are a, a lot of fun. Some of them are, are just so nasty, gross, and grisly, and funny at the same time. You don't know whether to cringe or laugh. That's an odd combo, but that's kind of fun. Um, I'm glad they put all these together because I don't think you were going to see these in too many other places. Um, Killer Cart is about grocery carts that that kill people. And again, that is gold as a 10-minute short. You turn that into a feature film, it's not going to work. You hear that, Maximum Overdrive? Exactly. Number nine in the top 10. By the power of Skull. Yes, it's time for He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, but not the live action film that I know and love. I'd seen that thousands of times, it seems. We are talking about a documentary from 2017 titled Power of Skull: The Definitive History of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. He-Man burst upon the scene when I was a junior in college. My roommate Rob and I watched an awful lot of that cartoon. I mean an unhealthy amount of that cartoon. Robert had a Skeletor mask. A friend of mine gave me an inflatable battle cat. It's, it was such a big deal with us that we actually liked the live action movie, which was terrible. This documentary looks at people like me and Rob. <laughs> it's as simple as that. And it explores the popularity of all things Eternia. And I've seen a few of these docs before. Uh, I saw one about Star Trek fans. I watched one about Galaxy Quest fans. They're all great. And, and you don't have to be a fan of what they're speaking about to enjoy it. Because when you see people that passionate about something and enjoying something so much... Something as seemingly insignificant as a cartoon that gives them joy, then that's a pleasure. And watching this, it brought back a lot of memories for me back to when I lived uh, with Robert after college, and it was some good times. All right, let's move on. Here we go. Number eight on our top 10 list is a, guess what, documentary. It's the second of three on the top 10 list. You always know that I'm going to have some documentaries for you. This, again, from 2000, is titled Sound and Fury. And Sound and Fury deals with the controversial topic of cochlear implants. And uh, I'm going to read this because I, because I had to research it. The, a cochlear implant is a surgically implanted neuroprothesis that provides a person who has moderate to profound hearing loss with sound perception. In other words, someone who is deaf can can undergo this procedure, and this implant is 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 inserted, and 
it gives them some, as the definition says, some sound perception. It doesn't solve everything. It doesn't make them hear totally clearly like a hearing person would, but it gives them sound perception. So as a hearing person, I was unsure of why this would be controversial. You have something that allows deaf people to hear? Why wouldn't that be a no-brainer for everyone who qualifies? That's what I thought. That's how I felt. But my thinking as a hearing person and not as a member of the deaf community, that's, that's part of what this movie is all about. Because my initial thought, as I just shared, well, why don't you get that? If you're deaf, why don't you get that? What I neglected to think about was members of the deaf community having children who are deaf and then struggling with the decision of what to do as far as their hearing future. And it's a, the, the rift from what I gathered in this documentary is, is between people who want to keep to, they, they want to remain a part of the deaf community. And some members of the deaf community think that if they get the implant for their child, their child's not going to be part of the deaf community. Their child's going to belong to a weird group that's not the hearing community and not the deaf community. And like I said, I was amazed to see both sides of this and and after seeing it, I still, I'm not quite sure where I stand on it because both sides were, uh, bo both sides were given a voice and you heard the merits, the pluses, the minuses, the pros and cons of both sides. And both sides have very, very good points to make, um, very enlightening to, to, see this uh, is very emotional film. This is obviously very important to, to all the people that are involved in this. And it was, it was very well done and was handled with respect to both sides of an issue that has caused this rift in the, in the deaf community. It was very, very, very interesting documentary to see. And again, that's from 2000 and it's titled Sound and Fury. They did make a, a follow-up documentary that I have not seen titled Sound and Fury Six Years Later. So they're following the, the young woman who got the cochlear implant as a little girl, and and they're going to talk to her, you know, six years later and how her life has changed and everything. So I'm looking forward to, to seeing that. Um, let's scoot up to number seven. Number seven is from 2021, and it's titled Hot Mother. Okay, this is a short from New Zealand, and it is 14 minutes long. And when it was done, I think I stared at my television for another 14 minutes. Let's go to IMDb. At an idyllic spa retreat, a vacationing mother and daughter bicker and avoid connection until an unfortunate accident occurs. You know that emoji with the with the really big eyes, the, the stunned look of amazement and disbelief and horror all mixed into one? That was my face at the end of this movie. Now, as, oh, as always for these top 10 lists, no spoilers, but wow, just wow. You want me to spoil this for you? Shoot me an email and I will spill my guts. It, it was unbelievable. Then the credits happen. And then I find out that it's based on a true story. Ah, yikes. That was something. And sometimes I'll watch a two-hour movie and 10 minutes later I forget it. And sometimes I watch a 14-minute movie and three weeks later I'm still thinking about it. And you've heard me talk about that before. Let's move on to number six. Number six and number five are both black exploitation films. And... TCM was doing a little black exploitation thing. They had Pam Greer on uh, and, and, and introducing some films and everything. It was, it was wonderful. So I, I looked for ones that I had never seen before. 
And one of the ones that I got to watch was Hitman, starring Bernie Casey. And this is a gritty black exploitation film shot in and around Hollywood and Los Angeles, and it's pretty volatile. Uh, Bernie Casey is the Hitman and friend of Cinema Wellman, Pamela Greer. She's billed as Pamela, not Pam, and she's along for the ride until a very bizarre movie exit. How Pamela leaves this film is, is something that you uh, you have to see to believe. <laughs> and if you know that it's a film made in 1972 about LA's underworld and porno scene, it's going to have a kick-ass soundtrack, and it does. That's Hitman with Bernie Casey in the title role. Next, number five in the title role, Cleopatra Jones in the Casino of Gold from 1975. Cleopatra Jones is played by Tamara Dobson. As the poster reads, six foot two inches of dynamite explodes into action. And that six foot two inches belongs to the lovely Tamara Dobson. And wardrobe isn't afraid to put that frame in some heels. Let's make her even taller. Tamara is downright Amazonian in this movie. Um, wardrobe also dressed her in some serious hats and scarves. Uh, I'm sure it was a huge chunk of the budget. Money well spent. Um, an extra to this was, you, you know, I, I seem to be talking about genres mixing. Uh, and and this is another one because this black exploitation film was produced by legendary martial arts producer Run Run Shaw. And it was shot entirely on location in Hong Kong and Macau, which gave it a kind of a James Bond feel. Um, the villain is played by scenery munching Stella Stevens. And Norman Fell plays Stanley, Cleopatra's superior. And you may recall Norman Fell playing Stanley Roper on Three's Company. Stanley, well, I digress. See this if you get a chance. It's a lot of fun. And do not mess with Cleopatra. Number four in the top 10 for October is from 1964. We've got another mashup of genres here. So in this one, we have a kaiju movie that's also a heist movie, which is, those are two of my favorite things. And the film is titled Dagora, and it's directed by Ishiro Honda, big friend, best friends of Cinema Wellman, because he, of course, directed Godzilla and many of the kaiju movies that I know and love. Here is the IMDb synopsis. An amorphous cellular life form descends from the atmosphere to consume carbon in the form of diamonds. <laughs> okay, so space monster Dagora is just here for the diamonds. That is tremendous. Whenever kaiju are involved or heists are involved, I am in. Put them together. My mind is blown and I am in the front seat of that van. That is Dagora. And I watched that on Criterion who went nuts with Ishiro Honda and kaiju movies uh, recently. And I, and I did catch up on a few of those that I had not seen. Moving on to number three, we have the third documentary in the list from 2014. It's titled The Barkley Marathons, The Race That Eats Its Young. Once again, synopsis courtesy of IMDb. A famous prison escape sparks the idea for a cult-like race that has seen only 10 finishers in its first 25 years. This award-winning, oddly inspiring, and wildly funny documentary reveals the sports world's most guarded secret. Perfect, IMDb. No notes. This was nuts. This was first run in 1986, and the marathon consists of five laps of a 20-mile course for a total of 100 miles. The course varies from year to year a little bit, as does the entrance fee. One year it was a license plate. One year it was a new shirt because founder and host Gary Lazarus Lake Cantrell needed some shirts. Only 40 people are chosen to participate each year. And if you're chosen to participate, Gary sends you a letter of condolence saying that you've been chosen. Um, the course is patterned after the prison escape route of convicted killer James Earl Ray. I'm not making up any of that. 
this that's how crazy this event is. That's how crazy this documentary it is. Now, I go into this knowing what it's about, and I, I, I'm not running anywhere. I'm, I've never been athletic. I, 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 but so then I'm starting to think, I must know people who could do this. Who could do this? And I thought of two people. I thought of my friend Robin, because Robin, Robin can run for days. And in my mind, Robin is capable of accomplishing absolutely anything. The other person I thought of is my friend Stephen, who's a former student of mine. And I thought of Stephen because Stephen's also a runner. And I thought that Stephen would be excellent with this because he would come up with something that no other participant in the Barkley Marathons had thought of before, and he would use that to his advantage. Um, if Robin or Stephen uh, want to apply, I can give them that information, and I would gladly accompany uh, them and serve them soup and fresh socks from the uh, comfort of my RV that would be well heated, um, and I'd be that friend. <laughs> For the rest of it, they'd be on their own with all the checkpoints and everything. It's wonderful. The Barkley Marathons. And the uh, the rest of that title is The Race That Eats Its Young. Wonderful. Two left. Both from 2005. The first one is Transamerica. And Felicity Huffman was nominated for uh, Best Actress uh, Academy Award for this. And, and this is... This may be one of the best performances in a film that I have ever seen. Um, she plays a transgender woman who uh, finds out that she mothered a son who's now hustling on the streets of New York. Um, and again, it, it might be, it, it could possibly be one of the best performances that I've ever seen. The story is about, obviously, trans, transgender people. It's also a story about what it feels like to not be accepted anywhere. What it feels like to never have a place where you feel comfortable being yourself. And it, it asks more questions than it answers because there are no easy answers to the questions that it asks. Um, but it certainly has the viewer rooting for Brie. That's, that's Felicity Huffman's character because, because she's such a brave, courageous person. This this was just something that uh, really stuck with me, the, the, the whole thing. It wasn't easy to watch when you see how she's treated by other people, uh, including her son. Um, but that doesn't mean it shouldn't be watched. Not all films are meant to be escapism. They, they have many... Many different functions in our lives. Escapism is just one of them. Which actually brings us to number one. And that's North Country. And this again, this was, this was not easy to watch. But what made it easier is the fact that it featured two of the best uh, actresses working today, in my mind. The Charlie's Theron and Frances McDormand. And they were both nominated for Oscars uh, for this fictional, fictionalized account of the first major successful sexual harassment case in the United States. Uh, the workplace in question is the male-dominated world of iron mining in Minnesota. And what these women miners were subjected to at work was so disgusting and reprehensible that while watching, I was actually ashamed to be a man. Uh, absolutely disgraceful, disgusting behavior. And none of the harassment or the brutality was fabricated for the film. If it's in the movie, it happened to one of the female minors. The filmmakers wanted to make sure of that. Real stuff is horrific enough that they did not have to make anything up. And again, I, I didn't want to watch this because of the subject matter, but with those Oscar nominations, it was on a list, and I'm glad I did watch it. Um, not every film should be easy to watch. Watch all of them. And and that's it. That'll bring us to the end of our monthly recap of what got screened at Cinema Wellman in the month of October. Hopefully you found something of interest or hopefully I steered you away of something that you might be wanting to see and I saved you two hours of your life. Um, 
If you want the platforms of any of those films, you can go to the blog. The blog is cinemawillman.com, and uh, other information about these films can also be found there. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram. That's at cinemawillman, and you can watch us on YouTube, and you can listen to us on Spotify. Upcoming, what do we have next for you? Our next episode is going to be uh, available on Wednesday, November 23rd, and that is going to be Remakes... And until then, take care.